This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with Eau Claire County. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9. Well, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Eau Claire County Board of Supervisors to order here on June 20th, 2017. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of reflection by Supervisor Gary Gibson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, I pray for all government officials and especially for the leaders of my own country. I pray for the president that he may conduct the affairs of national government within wisdom, bravery, and true justice. I pray for the members of Congress that they may truly represent the needs of the people and work in harmony for the advancement of all men, women, and children. I pray for the judges that rule the courts of our land that they may balance justice with mercy and civil law with divine mandate. Grant all our national, state, and local leaders the gifts of wisdom, justice, counsel, and fortitude that they may conduct the affairs of man in accord with the will of God. Grant to all men the gift of respect for lawful authority, justly exercised, that we may live as united people, one nation under God. May all the governments of the world seek to reconcile power with the needs of society, that they all strive to form bonds of unity between countries that we may one day share a united world of prosperity and peace. Amen. Thank you, Supervisor Gibson. If members would please take your keypad, indicate your presence here this evening to establish our quorum. We have a quorum. We'll move on to the journal of proceedings. Approval of those from May 16th. You'll find on pages four to five of your meeting packet. Are there any suggested changes to the journal of proceedings as drafted? I see none. I'd entertain a motion to approve them as drafted. Motion by Supervisor Mortimer, second by Supervisor Forsyth. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. <laughs> Moving on to the public comment period. This is an opportunity. Each meeting for members of the public to speak to speak to the board. Uh, we'll ask you to come up to the podium and uh, please uh, uh, keep your remarks to three minutes or less. We'd appreciate that. And we'll start with Jeff Smith, uh, followed by uh, Nick Walther. So, good evening and welcome. Thank you. I wanted to uh, come up and first of all thank you all and. Uh, tell you how pleased I am to see that the resolution for redistricting is on your agenda tonight, and that's what I'm here to speak about. Um, this I consider to be something that should be a unifying issue for all of us, and I, and I know many consider it to be, because this is something that is not partisan. It's something we're talking about actually adding a nonpartisan um, um, committee to draw lines for the state of Wisconsin. I want to, especially though, be sure to help people understand the difference between what the Supreme Court case is about and what this re resolution is about, and they are different. The Supreme Court case is taking on the current maps and determining whether or not they're constitutional or not and whether or not they should be redrawn, whether it be for the 18 or 20 election. This resolution is about what happens in the future, and we should all consider the future. The future is about our children. Should our children have to go through the constant bickering and divisiveness that we have now encountered in not only our state, but this country? We, not, we need to get away from that. We need to adopt a, cer a certain way that um, politics is, and, is, and I should say political lines are drawn so that they are not at the mercy of one party or the other. And again, I would offer the, um, 
the idea that you should vote for this. Uh, this would be the, we would be the 18th county to pass such a resolution. And most counties that I have seen pass this resolution, some have been unanimous, that, um, and even or two to one in favor of this. It would be a very easy, fair uh, thing. I don't know how anybody could consider this not to be, or vote against being fair, because we call this the Fair Maps Resolution. And again, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Nick Walther uh, is up next, and then Eleanor Wolf to follow. And if speakers could kind of maybe uh, be on the sidelines just so we can move things along. So welcome. Right yes, please. Yeah. Right. Hello, my name is Nick Walther. Um, I am uh, rather young, and I am admitting I just now getting involved, more involved in politics. That being said, um, the former speaker, Jeff Smith, mentioned uh, the future, going into the future and the nonpartisanship that seems to be uh, um, uh, necessary going into the future. As a purported representative of the future myself, um, and seeing the future in my eyes as my present, I believe that a uh, nonpartisan committee is absolutely crucial to the proper and fair governance of our local counties, and hopefully our states and federal governments. Uh, that being said, I understand that a rebuttal to this could be that it stifles good governance. Uh, to that, I respond with, in an era of discursive interests and an amplified amount of knowledge that is necessary for con uh, consideration of any and every single bill, shop, uh, shopping this out to an independent committee independent committee seems absolutely crucial to allow uh, the governors of our local uh, institutions uh, free space to consider the bills that they're passing, as opposed to trying to maintain a kind of fair uh, mindset in terms of elections. Um, I, I believe that this is by definition fair and should be considered uh, going forward as the one resolution that could um, <clears throat> really allow for people to con uh, participate um, more robustly. And uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate the input. By Eleanor Wolf, and then followed by Kurt Fox. Good evening. Hi. Thank you, uh, board members, and for putting this uh, redistricting issue on the agenda. And uh, I hope that you're going to speak with an overwhelming yes vote on this uh, resolution before you and support a nonpartisan committee to do the redistricting, to draw the lines. And uh, your vote is really important tonight. You're sending a message to our state legislature and, um, and you're telling the citizens of Wisconsin, of, of Eau Claire County, that you're representing them in wanting a fair process that uh, gives everybody a fair election. Well, a fair election, unless we can get the money out of uh, the politics, that'll be the next thing. But uh, at least this is a good start. And uh, ultimately, it's about uh, our uh, legislatures right now are picking their voters. And that isn't what a democracy is about. A democracy is about the voters picking their legislature. So please vote yes and a majority vote, maybe a, a overwhelmingly majority vote would be great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Kurt Fox, and well, Kurt's coming up last, if there's anyone else from the public who'd like to speak this evening, those are the only ones that have signed up on the list. So is there anyone else? I see none, so uh, you're the last one. Welcome. All right, thank you for not only the opportunity to speak, but having this resolution on the docket. Um, I honestly think this is a very simple thing to decide. We're talking about what is essentially gerrymandering, and we all know that it's unconstitutional. In fact, the Supreme Court just ruled that how we handled it in 2011 was un unconstitutional. We know for a fact we can do it wrong. We have screwed up in the past. What I want as a taxpayer is an assurance that something is being done to make sure we won't screw up like that again. Now, I've heard, not in this room, nobody has spoken against it, but out in public, uh, this may cost us money. I personally don't think there's any 
costs too high to make sure that there are fair elections. So I don't think that that's a very good argument. And plus, given the amount of litigation that has gone to prove that it was unconstitutional the way it has, I think at best it would be a wash. And again, doing this is still a very necessary thing. And really, the only way that I can see for voting no against this resolution is if you just, A, don't think it's a problem, or B, would like gerrymandering to continue, if you would like to continue to be unconstitutional. Um, if you don't like that, then I can see no other way to vote but yes. So I would implore you as a taxpayer, please do so. I do not like the fact that the way that we have to redistribute ourselves is unconstitutional. That's abhorrent to me, and I would hope it would stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our speakers uh, here this evening. Um, moving on to uh, uh, reports to the county board, and I see Susan Schaefer there. So Susan, why don't you come forward? Susan, of course, is our clerk of court, and uh, it's uh, an annual presentation, so welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the clerk of court office, um, we're part of the judicial branch of government and are organized and empowered by the Wisconsin State Statutes and Supreme Court rules. Um, we're the official record keepers for the circuit court and the jury management system. So those are the two main things we do in our office besides many other. Um, throughout 2016, we've been moving towards the electronic system, um, which became mandatory earlier this year on February 15th, it was mandatory that attorneys e-file um, for all their family, paternity, small claims, and civil cases. And then on March 1st, it became mandatory that all criminal cases were filed electronically um, by all the attorneys. Um, through collaboration with the judges prior to the mandatory e-filing dates, um, it was agreed that we would discontinue creating paper files as of January this year. Um, that was a really huge step to take because it's really difficult to go from looking at a paper file to calling it up on the system all the time. Um, and paperless and e-filing are two different things. Um, again, e-filing is filing your papers. Um, people that represent themselves don't have to e-file. They have the option to do so if they wish. Um, but it is mandatory for attorneys. And then paperless means we just aren't going to have paper files any longer. The biggest challenge to that has been, um, for one, getting used to it, but for another, when we have reserve judges come in, um, typically they've not ever worked in a paperless system. So getting them onto the computer and doing a little hand-holding has been a challenge, but um, some of them are getting there. Um, we've had a lot of things going on over the past couple of weeks. We've had dual monitors installed, which has been a tremendous help to the staff in our office. We weren't sure we would like it or that we would really use it, but it's been really helpful. Um, a wiring project has also been completed this last week, and that will allow CCAP to install um, dual scanner and printers for each of the courtrooms. The challenge we have there is learning new procedures for in-court processing and what exactly we can do in the courts um, during court sessions. Um, as you all know, our office opened last year. Um, we extended our hours, so we're open to the public from 8 to 5. That has been going really well. Um, there hasn't been any pushback by staff, and certainly not by patrons to the office. Um, we did lose three staff members this year, two to retirement, and one to the judges as a judicial assistant. So that was a challenge, trying to keep up with everything that we did. Um, two of those positions have been filled, and by Friday, June 30th, we'll have our last position filled. Um, so um, the one challenge that still remains in the office is all the back scanning we need to do. We have closed cases that are still in paper form, and when new hearings are scheduled, we have to be able to scan that entire file in so it's ready for the next court hearing. Um, 
<clears throat> you've probably heard about text messaging. Um, we implemented that. And what we're finding on our statistics is that about um, there's about a 4.45% failure to appear rate um, in all the cases that I've looked into. So that's been a really good thing for us. Um, a challenge there, though, is hoping that more and more parties in cases sign up for that. We can't make them do that, but um, we certainly encourage it. Um, I'm going to get into collections in a minute, but as I indicated, um, we've been really had a lot going on the past couple weeks, and um, on a continuing basis, but especially in the past couple weeks, I just want to say that our IS department has been amazing, um, helping us with our 911 calls to them that we have major issues in the courtroom, and we have a jury trial, and we need help and with our video conference system and all sort of our wiring that we had to do um, with CCAP. They've been very implemental in helping with that. that. And also um, our maintenance department has scrambled head over heels this, this week, actually on Monday. Um, we had a judge retire, so judges have been courtroom changing and they've come in and changed the the um, signs and are just working diligently for the a whole list of things that we need to have done. And they've been very, very implemental in getting those things done. So lastly, the, the hottest topic for our office is in collections. Um, just a little bit of history. I don't know how far back this goes or how it was started. But um, for years, Corporation Counsel and Finance Department and the Clerk of Courts were all doing collections. So a couple years ago, we talked to those two departments, and um, what we did is within the past year, we finished taking back all those collections into our office. And um, it's twofold. For one, when people call and say, how much do I owe? Well, we can give them that information now, where before we didn't even know if finance or court counsel had it. Now we have it all back. Um, we're also able to use the resources we have to um, do a little bit better at collections. Um, so in 2016, we did some research and took a little closer look into the um, state debt collection, which is SDC. It's a department within the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. And there were absolutely no cons that we could find to using them as a collection agent for us. They're not a collection agency, but they kind of are. Um, SDC has many fingers and many ways of collecting that um, our PPS collection agent is not able to do. Um, SDC can access employment information to garnish wages. They can access financial records um, to levy bank accounts. They can make payment plans with people, which is their, their first intention to do. Um, also through an agreement, SDC can, um, they can intercept Minnesota state tax refunds for people that owe us money. And um, the other thing they can do is individuals that have bank accounts, it's a national bank like Wells Fargo, if they have a bank account there, then SDC can access and levy those accounts, even if they're in another state. So we do, they do have far-reaching fingers. Um, there's no fee for the county to use SDC. So whatever they collect for our county, we get 100% of that back. Um, in order to use SDC and provide them with the information they need to do these things, um, in 2016, we contracted with um, Accruent, which is a part of LexisNexis. And there we can obtain social security numbers and more current addresses than we may have in our system. So that's a huge, huge thing. And right now, I want to introduce Ashley Pruse. She's the chief deputy in my <coughs> office. Um, 
she deserves a lot of credit for the SDC program that we're doing now, and she's going to talk a lot more about collection and, and how SDC works. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first slide that's been up for a while now, um, just a brief close. Um, overview of what our collection process is. We definitely want to give people enough window to make that payment and not, you know, issue sanctions against them right away and turn them over to state debt collection. So they do get 60 days typically from the date of disposition or the date the fine or fee is assessed. Um, if it's not paid or a payment plan is not set up in that time, um, we do issue those sanctions listed there. Um, after the 30 days past the due date is when we can officially turn it over to state debt collection. Um, we're not at that point right now since we have so much debt to turn over um, and it is manual enter at this point. Um, so we do submit all the debts that the debtor does owe us, not the re just the recent ones. So then if they are already on a payment plan or they're repaying in some form, that they can get all of the money versus just that 200 traffic ticket or whatever dollar amount um, one fine may be. Um, we do remo remove the tax intercept that we may have issued when we um, did sanctions at the initial due date, um, and that is because um, any debts submitted to SDC jump ahead of the typical trip um, or the general tax intercept that we would put against it. So that has been a huge um, part we've noticed as well. Um, we no longer submit any new debts to PPS. We still contract with them with the old debts that are turned over. Um, and that's because since it's a manual process, it is going to take us about two years to get everything turned over to SDC. So in that time frame, um, PPS should still be able to collect, hopefully, on some of those debts. Um, and again, we're not sticking with them or turning any new debts over because they do charge the county a 19% fee. Um, SDC does charge the debtor a $35 or 15% fee per debt. We do try to group, de group the debts together if possible um, to kind of lessen that fee because um, it is pretty hefty, but um, that is what they charge. So this graph just kind of shows you overall collections 2013 to 2017 year to date. Um, year to date 2017, we're kind of on, on track to bring in about 7,500 um, I'm sorry, $750,000 more, um, which would put us overall collections above that 2013 mark. So bring our collections back up to a higher mark. Um, just outstanding debt currently for the clerk of courts is about $18 million. Um, PPS has $7 million. SDC, we have turned over about $4 million, and that's just from September to um, to June, so it's pretty incredible what they've manually been able to turn over, um, and the balance of that 18, 000, or 18 million is um, still clerk of courts collecting or stuff that's collected through Department of Cor Corrections. Um, this one here just shows uh, what we, the blue is the overall collection, the red is what the state gets, and that tiny little thing in green would be what the county actually keeps of that money, so small portion um, of the overall collections that we do get. Um, this showing the trend for PPS, definitely why we're switching in addition to why the fee, they charge us a fee, but also um, the actual collections that they have been doing has definitely been decreasing. Um, we started canceling the debts with PPS in September of this year when we're turning them over to state debt collection. Um, and then just showing the two collection companies against each other, SDC and PPS. Um, it's tax season now, so we definitely collected more that way, um, but it has been... 32,000, um, 42,000, it's been pretty significant, the difference that they are able to collect, just because they have that ability, as Susan had stated, to kind of um, hold people more accountable to make payments. So that's all that we really had. I don't know if there's any questions on SDC or any? Great. Thank, thank you very, very much. Any questions for uh, Susan or Ashley this evening on uh, Clerk of Court uh, Supervisor Pagonis? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question um, to Susan. Um, Susan, if you'd come to the yes. podium, please. Um, my recollection was that um, when you were looking at changing the hours, there was a question from staff regarding they like to flex, they like to alternate, come in early, leave early type of thing. Um, do they still have the capability of doing that, or do you still exercise that in your... In your um, Yes. Yes, that hasn't been an issue, and staff who has flexed in the past continues to flex. Um, there are days maybe if somebody's on vacation, somebody else needs to stay later, but for the most part, there's been no issues with our flex. 
Can I ask a follow up? Sure. Yes. Um, so, with all of the um, electronic filing now, um, I would think that the pressure on all the docketing has gone way down. Is that a fair? Um, no, because it, it still takes time when, when an attorney e files. We still have to look at, has the payment been made, if it's a payment, if it's not a payment, if it's a, an additional filing. We still have to, there's still procedures we have to follow through for that. So it's not like we just hit a button and it's filed. Um, there are different things we have to do. And sometimes attorneys may file four things at one time and we need to make sure they all come in together. Um, so it, it is, I have heard um, some counties find that they have more time on their hands, but we have found we're still extremely busy. Um, it, it hasn't taken the load off us at all yet. <laughs> and then just one last sure. question to Ashley. Um, are other counties using the SDC um, service and have you heard re similar success stories? Yes, a lot of, um, I don't know what the count is up to now, but um, t I mean, last I knew it was 12. Um, people were st still kind of tiptoeing in it, figuring out everything that they needed to do to get it in place. Um, but I don't have exact numbers on other counties, but um, they've definitely had the same success and the fact that they aren't charged a fee has definitely been pushing people in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Stelges. Thank you. Uh, for Ashley, too. Regarding the debt collection, are, are those the sources of the debt? Are those like fees and fines, or specifically, I want to know, does it include restitution? That would not include restitution. Okay. That's right. something we're hoping to look at doing by the end of the year, is collecting that through our office um, to be a little more effective and actually getting that money back for that victim. Thank Still you. going with SDC for now. Thanks very much, and I don't see any other uh, questions here this evening, so uh, thank you both very much, and thanks for your service, and, and those on your staff as well. Uh, Eric Keisler, so over here. So, uh, Eric, uh, welcome. Uh, Eric, of course, is Executive Director of the Friends of Beaver Creek. This partnership with the county, the county owns the land at Beaver Creek, uh, the old county youth camp, and it's evolved over the years, and the Friends uh, uh, do the operational and get some financial support from the county, and with that, welcome, Eric. Hi, everybody. I've got a uh, presentation here that shouldn't take more than three hours, so just hang with me. <laughs> uh, from the cheap seats to how many people have been out to Beaver Creek Reserve before? Okay, so there's a few people who haven't, but I'm among friends, so that's always good to start a presentation that way. Um, where did Beaver Creek Reserve start? It looks a little more blurry on your screen than on my computer. Can you <laughs> focus that at all? That's the best we can do? Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, this is uh, a picture of the old uh, Eau Claire County Youth Camp back from 1946. And um, it was, this picture was used to raise money for the main lodge um, by the community and back in 19, 50 something, one or two, they actually built the main lodge for about $10,000. So that's kind of a fun fact because now the well on the property would cost more than $10,000 to replace. So um, kind of a neat, um, a neat picture. So yeah, 1951, Byron Yorns, a famous artist from Wisconsin, he actually did the letterhead for the egg department of the state, um, did this to help us raise money. The youth camp started in 1946, so there's this fun picture that he did of a charcoal drawing. At that time, camp only had 160 acres. Currently, Beaver Creek has just over 400, 400.3 to be exact. Um, Beaver Creek Reserve is about 12 miles away from the city of Eau Claire. Chippewa Falls, four miles north on Highway K. If you are missing something from one Menards and you know you have it at the other Menards, it would take you just as long to cross town to get your dire home weekend project done as it would to drive out from Eau Claire to come visit us. So we're not too far away. That's what I, I tell people who are interested in it. 
Um, we're in a unique, a unique property. We're bordered by uh, county forest land, the Eau Claire River, our namesake Beaver Creek, and then Dinehammer Creek within that 400 acres. Now we're going to talk about usership at Beaver Creek. Um, the youth camp was started as a grassroots effort after World War II in the recreation movement. And we have maintained a youth camp for places like 4-H, various church groups, scouts. They come out and rent our facility and enjoy their summer. Um, we are actually doing our, our Nature Nuts camps. That's the one week long day camp that we do throughout the summer right now and then for the rest of the summer we're booked um, right until school starts with other other groups using the facility. Um, as well as those individual groups we host over 5,000 overnight groups, 10,000 day users and 5,400 students through field trips. Um, this map doesn't look very good because it's blurry but it says that there's 57 different schools in 23 different school districts that come to visit us from as far north as Rice Lake, as far south as La Crosse, um, Nielsville, Owen Withy, um, Hudson. And then we have a various number of uh, clubs that come out and use us from photography to quilting, birding, watercolor artists. We have the bee club out there now that helps us keep our um, display of live bees. And so really Beaver Creek is more than just a youth camp now. It's really a community center that connects people's talents with their outdoor love. Um, and so that that makes us very unique I feel as well. Volunteer opportunities. We We've booked over 10,000 volunteer hours over the last three years with a peak of 14,000 hours. Um, depending on the grants that we're doing. If you threw a generic $10 an hour value on that, that means we're bringing in over $100,000 in volunteer labor to Beaver Creek just to keep it up, upgraded. I don't know if there's another county department that can talk about that much volunteerism going towards their area. So I think that speaks highly of the community's interaction with what we have. We do feel good things like highway cleanup. We've got the KQ intersection all the way down to the K bridge that we keep looking nice for the county. As well as we partner with other local nonprofits. So the United Way's Day of Caring in 2015, we did over $50,000 in volunteer projects in one day. We had over six different businesses out there. Excel Energy came out. Um, here's a few of the projects. We had a uh, erosion wall behind the nature center. We had old cedar siding that was falling apart and being chewed on and we replaced it with steel siding and all that work was done with volunteer labor. Also the retaining wall going down to the storm shelter um, was leaning towards the door. It's where we're sending kids in a storm, right? That's not where you want a retaining wall leaning. Um, we use some county capital repair dollars. We leverage that with the strong backs of all these employees and we had a foreman design everything, individuals lifted the heavy blocks, and by the end of the day we had, again, tens of thousands of dollars in work done. Um, we dropped over 80 trees that would have been a nuisance in the camp that day thanks to the XL Energy's uh, tree service. So, I mean, think about how much it costs to drop a tree in your own backyard and then times that by 80. I mean, it was just super powerful. Um, Beaver Creek, what's there? Um, We've got this map and I'm going to zoom in on each of these buildings and show you a bigger picture. The map's not showing up that well, but we've started rever referring to Beaver Creek as a campus. At the last uh, insurance estimate, there was $5.3 million of the buildings out there. Matt Tyson just uh, sent me an email today asking to do another review next Thursday. So we'll see what the new value of it is assessed for. But our showpiece is our nature center. It's the number one reason people visit our uh, institution based on surveys from the community. So <clears throat> thanks to capital repair and replacement funds and under the guidance of Matt Tyson and Frank Draxler, we've installed new furnaces, air conditioners. We put on a metal roof in the past. Um, we've replaced carpeting and, um, and siding. One of the things that was there when Matt Tyson first started working with me when we started the new contract as we had some electrical panels in the basement where water was running through our air conditioning units 
and going right past the electrical circuits in the basement, and Matt said, that's got to stop yesterday. <laughs> so we were able to move all the electrical panels to the new addition. Um, we cleaned up the repair. You can see the top and kind of mildew around the electrical panels to the clean wall below. So we're doing things that maybe aren't necessarily always the most aesthetic things, but are integral to the building's operation. And then on top of that, we're getting donations. We got a brand new door. The other one was falling apart. Um, you could pull on it really hard and it would pop the lock out of it. Now we have one that's a key code access. It locks automatically every night and the security system arms. And that was brought through a donation that we, uh, a grant that we got. So we're doing things that are visible and not. And one of our greatest accomplishments in the last two years is we received a $200,000 matching grant from Shields of Eau Claire. This shows a, a tank wall on the left that was designed in 1984 to the rendition of what it would look like. Um, we opened up the new discovery room in June of 2016. <clears throat> Since we redid the exhibits in the Nature Center, we also launched a new website. We had an 82% increase in attendance. I'm super happy about that. Bruce Willett's sitting in here, and when I first met Bruce and got this job five years ago, he told me that uh, Beaver Creek was the secret gem of Eau Claire County. And I have, ever since then, been trying to get rid of the word secret. It truly is a gem, and as people found out when we had these new um, displays redone, our attendance was really big, and I expected a spike last year because we had all this publicity and these new exhibits, and so I expected that to drop again this year, but we're actually 33% up from last year's numbers as of the end of May. So I feel like there's a lot of capacity here for bringing the community out and connecting them with nature. And again, we leveraged that project with local businesses and volunteers. They came in and did the demolition of that entire room, again, saving us thousands of dollars versus contracting that out. Um, additionally to that, we've been writing um, Federal Trail Grant Acts through the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund. In the last four years, we received $175,000 in matching grants. We replaced the, um, we remodeled the bathroom in the Nature Center. We've redone the bridges and boardwalks on the trails. We put in all new signages. When I showed up at Beaver Creek Reserve, the Nature Center didn't have its name on the building. If you're trying to welcome people and connect them with nature, you should put the name of the building on it and say welcome. <laughs> now we have a sign that does that, I'm very pleased. So there's a lot of people who grew up in Eau Claire and they know about this, but Eau Claire is expanding. We want to reach out and welcome everybody and then give them the, the tools to get out on the trails. In the past three, four years, I would get calls from the trails on a cell phone saying, hey Eric, I'm by number six, how do I get back to the nature center? It's great connecting people with nature, we just want to bring them back to their cars at the end of the day. <laughs> and since we've implemented the signage with color-coded trails, we haven't had a single person get turned around. So really important. Um, one of those grants also, we're leveraging county capital repair and replacement dollars. We were going to seal coat a bunch of the driveways, and we realized that the parking in front of the nature center wasn't um, big enough to handle all of our capacity. We have people actually parking out on, on County K, little kids trying to come in and utilize the Nature Center. So we've doubled our parking. Um, again, there's a lot better map there than you're seeing. But um, we leveraged, we didn't want to just seal coat what we had. We wrote a grant, we leveraged the dollars from the county. We got another donor to donate another $38,000 to help us with the water retention, new LED lights in the parking lot. And that's actually out to bid right now. Um, a lot of people within the department have been helping us. John, uh, Matt Tyson, Frank Draxler. Again, using the county resources. The Shields Discovery Room, here's some kids actually getting to utilize it. The budget actually came in. It's under its goal of, of $500,000. The county contributed $15,000 in paint and carpeting, and the rest of that was brought in by local grants and donations. So. We're really proud to take the county's investment dollars and grow those in every way that we can. And I see us being a great resource of county, county funds. One of our most exciting things that's happening this year is we had um, a major donor give us $120,000 towards putting solar panels on the Nature Center roof. So by the end of July, um, 
we will be 100% net zero with electrical usage from our nature center. Um, <clears throat> and we'll be doing a press release about that in the next coming weeks. We've got a main lodge. We just, about five years ago, prior to me, put a metal roof on that with the help of XL Energy during a day of carrying. We also replaced all the windows and doors on that building. Donations came in and we did redid the countertops, the floors, and the kitchen. We also got some new equipment in there for all the 5,000 kids that come in. The observatory, we had an insurance claim because squirrels had gotten in and started chewing on the electrical wiring. And so we replaced the electrical and did some painting about four years ago. We also had a donor come in and um, help us metal side the uh, domes so that critters couldn't get in. Mother Nature is tenacious. We love her, but she can be uh, a force to reckon with when you're trying to deal with $5.3 million with the buildings. And so we've been trying to look at it in a sustainable way is how do we keep up with this where our maintenance people cannot worry about roofs that are leaking or siding that's getting chewed through and we can spend more time making sure the trails are cleared and that people are having an enjoyable experience when they come out to visit us. Our bathrooms are clean, the grounds are kept up. Um, fun fact for those of you who haven't been out there before, our observatory is open for the public for free every Saturday through the summer. You can check their website. They're another volunteer group within our volunteer group um, that just geeks out about the stars. And they're incredibly knowledgeable and they like sharing their knowledge with the community. And they actually do a program every third Sunday of the month, um, except for in December. Our Citizen Science Center is our newest building. Since it opened in 2006, we've done $1.3 million in grants that have been coming into the Chippewa Valley. I like to think about us as being a creator of resources. Beyond that monetary value, we've been putting up bad houses. We've built over 3,000 bluebird houses. As we've built our homes, we've cut down every dead tree for miles. Bluebirds are a cavity dweller. You put up a bluebird house, they have a place to live. It's a success story in the environmental movement. A bluebird house, you see them everywhere. And Beaver Creek has put up five trails. We've got them at three different golf courses. It's a fun thing everybody can get involved with. We monitor all of those, we send out the data. It's a national citizen science model that works and it's a, and it's a success story, excuse me. We have five different banding operations where we ban birds. We have the oldest red-breasted nuthatch in the world was banded at Beaver Creek Reserve. And we work with six different other counties with citizen science projects. We've been in Taylor County, working with their highway department to identify invasive um, plants along the roads. We've been in Chippewa County Forest working with their um, water flow systems. We have written the lake management plan for Lake Altoona, Lake Halley, and Lake Holcomb to name a few. We're not just at 400 acres, we're really talking about the entire Chippewa Valley and Beaver Creek has now become a resource for the entire western side of Wisconsin. And so we're out there working and partnering with all these different lake associations and other county governments and the DNR trying to make sure that we're preserving the great resources that we have here locally. Eric, if you could wrap up pretty quickly here. Like four, four more minutes? <laughs> okay, well 15 minutes was, which you should have been told and if you weren't, we'll make sure that communication happens. But that's what we're working on. So three so more hours. As as you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've got a citizen science center that also has a wildland school. They don't teach to the test. They were the 11th best high school in the state and the fourth best middle school. We've got other cabins. At every point, we've leveraged county dollars with volunteers to make it an incredibly efficient resource for the county. County put in $50,000 to the shower house. My first day I cut the ribbon on the new shower house. It was the easiest thing I had to do. They invested, the Eau Claire County invested $50,000. We raised another 150. We just refurbished the caretaker house. Western Dairyland built a brand new garage. We poured the concrete with our employees. We did a 60,000 plus building for under 27. We constantly are working to do that and on top of that we have volunteers in our greenhouse 100 percent volunteer run 
raising $9,000 for us a year, a butterfly house with over 3,000 visitors a summer. First weekend in August, we have a festival. We just put in Nature Nooks from a 3M grant that was for $50,000 that we brought in. We have more young families coming to visit us and play in our outdoor areas in our new center every day. It's a big reason that we're, we're relevant. Nine miles of trails. We rent out cross-country ski and snowshoe equipment. Part of the Shields grant was we got all new equipment. We're open year-round. Attractions change daily. We have programs. You can tap maple syrup trees, maple trees for maple syrup. You can eat the maple syrup at our French toast breakfast. What do you got for questions? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric. And I should note, uh, Bruce Willett, uh, Katie Forsyth, and Heather Duluk are on Friends Beaver Creek board as well as uh, Kathy Clark. So, um, uh, questions, Supervisor Wilkie? <clears throat> Not so much a, a question as a, a compliment to uh, the board. Um, I think this is a, a testament to a good, uh, this long report is a testament to a decision <laughs> that was made back some time ago uh, to uh, kind of cut uh, Beaver Creek loose to be a nonprofit so that they could in fact, and the concept was, be leveraging grants, volunteers. Now it's still a county facility and our willingness to make a commitment so they knew what they had to work with, what they had for leverage. So I was very pleased to hear that, in fact, you are uh, carrying through with what the uh, hope of this board was when it made that decision a number of years ago. So good job. Keep that going. I, I think that was a wise decision by this board. Thanks. Uh, Supervisor uh, Mortimer. Uh, Eric, a question. I um, wanted to compliment you and the work at the Beaver Creek Reserves with the grants and the public-private things that are happening. I mean, the dollar amounts are just pretty incredible. And kudos to you and the folks there and, and seeking those and developing that. And um, You know, I've been to many forest preserves and nature centers, both in Wisconsin and out of Wisconsin, and I just have not ever seen another one with a university telescope on the property and a public school, a charter school. And I'm just kind of curious, um, and the reason I ask you this is today my uh, sixth grade daughter received her Wildlands acceptance letter. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. So middle school and high school at Wildlands, and she just is so excited. Um, the question is, uh, how did those innovations, like with the university or with the Augusta School District, come about? Uh, how, how did that idea happen, or it, it just is so innovative and unusual? Is there is there a bit of history there? That, um... There is. I'm going to have to take you out for a beverage and sit down with you <laughs> to give you the full story. But ultimately, the fun part about Beaver Creek and the fun part about my job is I'm the director of a friends organization, and we're surrounded by friends. People are thinking about innovation. They want to work with us. We have we have leaders in industry and businesses around us coming to us to volunteer at our location. And I, don't, I can't even make it happen, you know, I couldn't even wish it up. It's just we have all these great ideas coming to us. Oftentimes it's just hard to say no, we can't take on something else, or really truly narrow it down to the focus of our mission and connecting people with nature. I'm so glad that that happened. And um, since I graduated from high school, went on for a short professional career and came here, things like the Butterfly House, things like the Wildland School, things like the Citizen Science Center really have put a new twist to Beaver Creek and made us a regional facility and brought recognition statewide and nationwide to our center. We're the only Citizen Science Center in the state. I mean, it's amazing. We've had $1.3 million of the grants come through it. I mean, it's, it is a success story. And I can't take any credit for it, but I will continue to work to make sure that it is successful. Thanks. Any other questions for Eric this evening? Uh, Supervisor Gibson. Yeah, I just wanted to make one short comment. Uh, in spite of what Chairman Moore said, I think your uh, presentation tonight, in spite of it being one, was very interesting. I wasn't bored at all. Like some presentations. But I've been out to Beaver Creek a few times, and it, 
it's enjoyable to spend time out there. Um, I've worked with the uh, Boy Scout troops as a scoutmaster for quite a few years, and we participated in a lot of events out there, which was really good for the scouting. Um, uh, the other thing is I, I sent uh, Chairman Moore an, an email as you were speaking because I would like to have a copy of that PowerPoint presentation. And if there's anybody else on the board here that also would like it, um, I asked Greg if, if we could all get a copy of it. Thank I'll, you. I'll forward it on. Yeah. That'd be great. Actually, yeah, we can get it to Catherine and we'll get Angie to get it out to everyone. Sounds good. I was told I had 20 minutes and I could push it one or two, so I, I may have been. <laughs> we'll have the staff yeah. follow up on that. Sorry about the miscommunication. You did really well, and you were responsive, and I appreciate it. And I might have been a little more flexible had there not been so much on our legislative agenda this evening. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, and I was not bored. Just <laughs> so there's no misunderstanding. Thank you very much, Eric. Pre appreciate it. Um, and uh, Administrator Schott, you just want to you go there? Okay. I will because I think he okay. disconnected you. Well. Oh, I think. Just one moment. Um, my update is simply to um, let the board know about two ways that we're going to be communicating information to you regarding the Economic Development Summit, regarding the Economic Development Summit and the strategic plan. Um, we're going to create a website presence for both of those initiatives where we'll have information about the history and about where we are going with all of the relevant documents available right on those websites. And I just wanted to show you briefly what they look like. So if, okay, I've got to find the, excuse me. My link, there we go. So the first one, and I will email these links to you this evening so that you have them. Um, the first is for the Economic Development Summit. The Committee on Administration had considered the county's participation in continued dialogue around economic development efforts in our region and had agreed to participate in that dialogue. And that information, all of the information, background, and everything is located on this website. So I will send it to you. I encourage you to take some time to look through it. If you have any questions or if there's something that you would like more information on, um, my office would be happy to provide that to you. And if you have any recommendations for something else you'd like to see on this website, please do let us know. Also, we're going to use a website tool for communicating um, updates on our strategic plan. There are a number of different groups that are working on the nine different goals that the board identified. They have been taking their work products back to the Committee on Administration, Committee on Finance and Budget, or whichever committee has oversight into the area that they are actually working on and getting input and then providing more output. And so again, we've created a website so that you can keep abreast of what is happening with our strategic plan. And at any time that you want to go to that page, you can actually go to the strategic plan website. And we have the initial documents that were created by the board. And then there are the hyperlinks or the blue area it's a little bit difficult to see, but there are blue areas where you have hyperlinks and you can drill down into the detail and look at the recommendations that are being brought forward and get updates on exactly where we're at. One of the things that I wanted to highlight is the um, scorecard that was created and that gives a visual point I know it's very difficult to see. I don't know why it's not translating well to the screen at all. But it is on our website. I will send you the link. Hopefully, then you'll get a better vision of it. You'll be able to see it. The scorecard, again, is a single-page document that has arrows either um, 
red, green, or yellow, meaning we're making progress is green, we're not making progress red, and it's at a neutral position, yellow. So it'll show you exactly where each one of those goals are at so you can get the overall picture. And again, if you have questions or would like more information, either um, I can help you. We have members of our core team, John Johnson, Jennifer Spockeen, Tim Moore, who are part of a, a work group that's a core team that's continuing to work with this. And each team has a team leader, and we'd encourage you also to contact the team leaders. And all of that information is on this website as well. That is all I have, sir. Thanks. Any questions for Catherine this evening? Any of those items? I see none. Um, thank you. We'll move on to presentation, petitions, claims, and communications. There's correspondence from the Town of Fairchild, the village of Fairchild, concerning the library. And I'll refer that to the Finance and Budget Committee. Um, I might note that you should have name tags on your desk. So, uh, so when you go to a, a neighborhood association meeting or a chamber of commerce ribbon cutting or any kind of a public event, you now have uh, a name tag. So you all should have that if it's uh, uh, so. Uh, um, hope you enjoy that. Any other announcements uh, this evening from anyone? I still oh, Supervisor Larry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to let everyone know that on Thursday evening, June 22nd, at the Fairchild Senior Living Facility, we are going to be, the Eau Claire County Housing Authority is going to be holding a hearing and do a tour of the facility and also hear residents' concerns. So if you're in the area, stop over. Six o'clock, we'll have some uh, light refreshments as well. Thank you. Any other announcements? I see none. We'll move on to uh, first reading of uh, ordinances by committees. Files, uh, oh, let me get you on here, okay. uh, File 16. This ordinance makes changes to the county code in chapters 2.04, 2.05, 2.06 per requested by the strategic plan process. And we'll bring that back at our next meeting. And let me just note that this one and the next three we'll be bringing back to the next meeting on July 18th. But please take a close look at this. Many of these are, are uh, just uh, editorial cleanup changes to the code. Some are, are a little more substantive. If you've got questions, please contact Keith. If you have amendments that you'd like to suggest, please contact Keith uh, uh, prior to that meeting. Uh, file 22. To amend section 19.01.001 of the Code Authority. To amend section 20.09.06 of the Code Treated in Purpose Surfaces. To amend section 20.15.001 FF of the Code Definitions. And likewise, bring that back at our next meeting on July 18th, File 24. This ordinance makes changes to the County Code in several chapters of Title II Administration per request by the Strategic Plan Process Review. And bring that back to our next meeting. And lastly, file 29. This ordinance makes changes to 2.15, 10.02, and 12.34 as part of the strategic plan process. And we'll bring that back in our next meeting. Uh, I know there's two issues uh, uh, from various committees that are of particular public interest. Uh, file 15, uh, concerning from County of Parks and Forest, and County 20, or Resolution 23 from administration. So if there's no objection, I'd like to take those up at this time. And I see no objection, so I'll ask the clerk to read file 15. Withdrawal of approximately 36 acres, more or less, from the county forest law, directing the Parks and Forest Director to make application to the Department of Natural Resources for withdrawal of said county land from the county forest law. May I have a motion, please? Motion by Supervisor Henning, second by Supervisor Gatlin, and an explanation by Supervisor Lavelle. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Moore. As uh, everybody on this board knows that since 2002, we've, well, we've had problems for a long time, but in 2002, we started dredging uh, Lake Altoona, and then we went on to Lake Eau Claire, so it's been a problem for years. And right now, uh, we're running out of places to put the spoils, the sand, if anybody knows or anybody wants any, we got a lot for them. <laughs> come and get a few loads, but uh, we're running out of places to put it, so the Lake District, uh, Lake Eau Claire, uh, for the last probably over a year, they've been trying to find a place, they've been doing studies, and they did find uh, a 
37 acre uh, uh, off uh, H, I believe it is. But uh, it's not a real good, the, the timber on it's not real good. It's kind of scrub oak. And uh, uh, for the situation where they're hauling from right now, it's the most feasible for the distance to drive. And uh, not, it's not a real good piece of land. And uh, so they, they did a study, the Lake just studied it, and went to the DNR, and they studied it, and went to our parks and forest director, and he looked through it, and it went to the conservationist from the county. And they came back with the, all four of them, said that was probably that would be the best place to put it. So right, what we're going to do right now is to, uh, we have to withdraw it from the, Clare County Forest Land and uh, uh, paperwork to go through, and they'd like to get an answer to get moving on it so they can, this winter, when they can start to do the dredging. So, uh, the quicker they get that answer, and like I said, been, we've been going through this for about a year now. Two years? It's been a long time. <laughs> so, uh, I hope the board would pass this. If they have any questions, we do have. Representative from the DNR, Brooke Sludwig is here, Josh Peterson is with us, uh, and Marla Orth from the Lake District is with us, so they can answer any questions that the board has a lot better than I can. So, like I said, they, uh, they came back, the, all four of the uh, different groups said that would be the best place. So I hope the board will support this. Thank you for the explanation, Supervisor Lavelle. Any Questions or discussion? Uh, Supervisor Dunning. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one is I see the financial impact in your last paragraph as far as uh, replacement. Is there any financial impact as a result of taking it out of the forest uh, uh, land? Uh, Supervisor LaBelle? As far as Jim, to take it out? Is it? Yes. Right. No, the, we're gonna we're gonna log it off with the, the timber is pretty poor. It's like eight eight hundred or nine thousand dollars that's gonna go into the, the land in the resolution that goes in the land acquisition. But as far as the impact, uh, okay. and and if we do when we do replace it, there is money in the land acquisition fund right now to replace it, and you can get matching fifty percent matching funds from the state too. So as far as the financial burden of the county. Second question is, uh, what is the contamination status of that material that you'd be putting out there? And uh, as a tag along to that is uh, we've uh, approved the uh, uh, hauling of sand from a, develop a commercial development to the Lowe's Creek Park. Uh, would that have been an opportunity for us to get rid of the uh, dredging? Well, financially, Good break yeah, at uh, about three miles a gallon on those big uh, trucks to haul it. You know, uh, financially it would not be feasible. And right now the lowest creek thing is kind of on hold too. Do the we're having a uh, problem with wetland out there in the lowest creek. So, no. What about the contamination level? But the contamination. Are there concerns about contamination out of here? Faster if Josh. Uh, I don't believe there is. I've worked with the gravity okay. engine that's better than I can. I don't believe they've been, they've, it's not the first time they've been doing it. Okay. Okay. It looks like Marlowe feels like he can answer Supervisor Dunn's question. Any objection to him? Marlo, why don't you come? Because this is being broadcast for community television, so if you come to the podium, that would be uh, helpful, please. So the question is will these soils, will there any, be any contamination concerns? Uh, th this was tested, it was tested by heirs uh, back in 2001 and two, And there are no PCBs, heavy metals, or anything else that we're concerned with. So we're good to go. We're very fortunate. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Stelges. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Back to Supervisor Dine's questions about impact from withdrawal from the forest. I might ask if 
Uh, Director Peterson might talk to that. Is Josh here? Yeah. yeah. Don't we lose something in PLIT? The, the By withdrawing from the county court? The towns would. The, town, the, town, yeah, the townships would lose revenue. Uh, they get a payment from the state called payment in lieu of taxes. So by withdrawing this from the county forest, townships will lose revenue that they would get from the state. Is that correct? It's, 30 it's not a big. It's not a big amount. Pretty nominal, but there is some impact on that. Um, okay, that's the first point. Uh, I would agree with Marlo as far as contamination. I don't think we know of anything, but it's kind of uh, somewhat related, I think, to Supervisor Dunning's question about using the material elsewhere. We also did explore whether the uh, existing uh, high crush mine out in that area would take this material as part of reclamation and they uh, declined to do that because their environmental staff would not allow them to accept material from outside that site for fear of contamination. So they won't use it for reclamation. So uh, They have some concerns but I guess the testing that was done 14 years ago is probably the best reference point that we have. Uh, one other point I, I would point out and I'm sure a lot of people can can echo this. There was a very lively debate as far as what location we should use here. I personally feel that the site we're choosing is a high value environmental site, very close to a creek, but uh, that wasn't the decision of the committee to proceed with that. So I think that the issue was well vetted, well debated, and this site was arrived upon. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or discussion? Any other discussion? I see. Oh, I'm sorry. Supervisor Anton. With regard to the testing, things can change, and it was, was suggested by High Crush uh, uh, they weren't entirely convinced that there was not a problem. Would it be worth our doing some additional <coughs> testing as we proceed with the project? Supervisor Lavello? I, I didn't understand his question. Oh. Uh, the, the testing that was done appears to have been some years ago. Situations uh, can change. Uh, is it worth doing testing as we do the dumping to see that, in fact, there is no toxic material present? Well, they've just they just dredged uh, Lake Altoona a couple winters ago, and they've been dredging. It's an ongoing thing at Lake Eau Claire. They've been doing that. I don't see where you get any contaminated material on the river. I don't know, Marlo can probably have that better than I can. But I don't know if there's any need for any more testing. Uh, I, I, DNR could probably have to. Anybody involved with Lake Eau Claire, kind of, or Supervisor Stelgis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be a really good idea. And I don't think that the Lake District would have any problem with testing that before you dredge, would you? Assume somebody's paying heirs to, to I mean, do it. It's not case in point, where can stuff come from? I think, for example, city of Altoona just had to replace a number of homeowners along the lake and give them city water because their wells have been contaminated by the railroad right there running into the lake. So it's not like there can't be new sources that come up. Uh, well, I would think that the Lake District would be That'd be a wise thing to do to test before we dredge and deposit. But I guess I would defer to them if they'd like to take that on. I applaud that. Uh, Supervisor Henning. The railroad has no comparison to the, the dredging of the lake. That's, that goes back many, many years where the fuel was dumped there in the coal and, and it's a long ways from the lake. Oh, I agree. And they did it more is a, a benefit to the railroad when they did this project than it was for contamination. They did that to help themselves, the railroad did it, to help themselves. As far as high crush, <clears throat> their, their judging of that sand is for their own use, not that it's contaminated for what we wanted to do. Um, Supervisor Dunning. Um, just to follow up on uh, Supervisor Stelges, uh, uh, the tests that were done in 2002 were on soils that were came in at that point in time. Since that time, all new soils have come in or we wouldn't be dredging. 
and they've come from further upstream as well as water sources that come from upstream. So uh, any particular uh, chemical spill or anything that came up from upstream would uh, now come into those areas and it would be, uh, I think, something that we should be looking at on a f maybe not every load that comes out, but at least on a annual or a couple, or a semi-annual or a biannual uh, type situation. Uh, Supervisor Lavelle. I, I don't know, if, where did we get to 2002 when they started testing it? I, I just said they started dredging in 2002. I didn't know when they, if they, if that was the last time or the first time or the last time they tested well, it. I, I think Marlo mentioned that's when Ayers did the, 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 the analysis. Ayers did it at that time. At that time, okay. Supervisor Schaffnagel. I just wanted to say that with the spoils that are going into the this proposed location, as well as any spoils that are in the existing location, um, we're looking as time goes forward for sources that want sand, and any of those sand sources could be taken up by any company who wanted to purchase them or work a deal to um, extract the, the sand from um, the gravel pit or the um, new location coming forward. Thank you. And Supervisor Gibson. Supervisor Gibson. Uh, you're on here. You're not on there? No, it's not on here. Um, one thing I would like to bring up is there is current monitoring going on in the rivers. There's also an Eau Claire River Coalition that's been put together that Eau Claire County is also participating in that we've actually put in, uh, into our budgets. And they are working together, I think there's like six or seven, six counties that are all involved in this because of sand and stuff, runoff, and everything that's coming into the river, which also feeds into Oak Park County. So this is being very closely watched. That's addressed <coughs> pretty much every year to take care of pretty much what the questions are asked about contamination. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion or debate? I, Supervisor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with Mr. Orff about this particular project and there were some things that I thought were really important for us as a county. One of them being the, one of our prime concerns is the two bodies of water that we have in Eau Claire County, Lake Altoona and Lake Eau Claire. And looking at the viability of the lake themselves and the fishery and keeping it as a resource for the county. So I appreciated the effort being made to try to preserve that resource. It's my understanding that the site that they're talking about is about one mile from where they'll be extracting the material to be deposit, deposited there. And that site will actually endure for approximately 20 years. And to think in terms of it being viable over that long period of time certainly means that they are going to have to go through this process again for a while. I also know that back a few years ago, quite a few years ago, when there was an issue during dredging of having Elk Creek Lake at a, at a point where there was nothing much more than a creek running through where the lake used to be, that property values at that time dropped precipitously. So when you look at preserving the lake, we're not just preserving the lake, we're preserving the value of the land around the lake as well, and the, the interests in the investment of the property owners that live there. I think this organization has made a terrific e effort, and mostly volunteer, to be able to assure the county that they, they try to keep this lake as pristine as they possibly can. And, uh, for me, I think that the fact that they also are already talking about reforesting that land, um, the, the, to be able to 
take it back once it's been used for the purpose that it now is currently needed for. Um, it means that they haven't just done this haphazardly, but they've really taken time and effort to determine the best way to be able to handle this. So I would support this uh, particular resolution. I see no other requests to speak. It appears you are ready to vote. So if, uh, let me repeat the motion. It is file 15. The motion is the withdrawal of approximately 36 acres, more or less, from county forest law and directing the Parks and Forest Director to make application to the Department of Natural Resources for withdrawal of said county land from the county forest law. So if you please vote. Supervisor McKinney, if you do that one more time, thank you very much. Uh, that motion passes 23 yes and 2 no. Um, moving on to uh, file 23. Supporting creation of a nonpartisan procedure for the preparation of legislative and congressional redistricting plans. I have a motion, please. Motion by Supervisor Leary, second by Supervisor Strofnickel, and an explanation by Supervisor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank our Supervisor Trotnagel for uh, bringing this resolution forward to the Administration Committee. I can't think of a time, uh, certainly over the past decades, when perhaps there's been less public trust of government than there seems to be at this point in time. I think this particular resolution is a trust-building measure, a measure that can help the public to again have confidence and the very vehicles the, that are used to be able to preserve our democracy. I don't look at this as being partisan in any fashion. I look at it as a way for us to be able to make a bend in the road, for us to be able to reassure the individuals who are voting and who are obviously involved in our democracy feel that there's a fair process for that to happen. So uh, I would urge people to support this measure. Thank you very much, Supervisor Bates. Uh, questions or discussion on this matter? Questions or discussion? Supervisor Wilkie. I would encourage my colleagues' support uh, of this resolution. I'm very pleased that many other counties in the state have also pushed forward with this. Unfortunately, both parties are are guilty of this undemocratic process of gerrymandering. You know, I got my name Jerry from my uh, mother's sister, and I'm very proud of that name, but I'm sure not proud of it when it's associated in any way with gerrymandering. So uh, I, I would hope uh, uh, that this board will, I hope unanimously, uh, support a democratic process to figuring out how we redistrict rather than political games by either party. Supervisor Gatlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, of course, echo everything that my past few colleagues as well as the speaker said, and we do support this resolution. But the reason I support it is the money, the dollars is going to save the taxpayers. Currently, the way they um, draw the lines whether it be one side of the aisle or other, or the other, they're hiring uh, private attorneys to do the work, which is costing taxpayers lots of money. If we use the Legislative Reference Bureau, um, there is no a limited minimal cost to the taxpayer. I understand in the state of Iowa that uh, uh, many states are trying to pattern this off of, they spend about $600 to do this, and that's to rent the vans to take the uh, people around to show them the borders. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Schroffnickel. I'd like to thank um, supervisors. I'd like to thank administration for taking this um, resolution up. And I support the resolution and hope that our colleagues do as well, as well as the rest of the counties who haven't jumped on board to bring this forward. Um, I think there's about 52 of them now. Thank you. Supervisor Conlon. Well, I'm sorry, Jerry, but I think it won't be unanimous. Um, the, my biggest problem with this is I think this is not democratic, it's actually a little bit less democratic in the sense that you are 
offloading. Uh, uh, you're, who picks the, the nonpartisans? I've never met a nonpartisan person in my life. When, when all everything is said and done, everybody has a certain, you know, a certain bias one way or another, rightly or wrongly, regardless. I mean, you can't have a brain without being somewhat partisan one way or the other. It's just uh, it, it, impossible. So who picks this? So you got a panel that's picked by whom? The Republicans? The Democrats? How does this work? I mean, right now, at least now we know who's responsible. It's the people we elected. Now we're going to elect people to select people that are, are, are not accountable. That's the whole, that, that's actually non-democratic. So I just don't think it's, you know, it's laudable to say we don't want the politics to be in this, but I don't see a way to get it out. And I think this is the wrong way to go because you're actually putting you even at a more distance from the electorate. And I think that's a mistake. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Mortimer. Uh, I'd like to comment too that um, I appreciate this coming before the county board and uh, this is a, a, an important issue for discussion and I've also been hearing lots of conversations about this at uh, eggs and issues breakfast around the table and um, it's a very good conversation. Uh, I had the privilege as a transfer student in my undergraduate years at UW-Eau Claire to have two semesters with the legendary Carl Andreessen for, Carl, for con law, constitutional law. And uh, we covered a lot of the gerrymandering case, cases, uh, case law in his classes. And I do remember that um, whenever a party was out of power, it was often the other party that was very interested in bringing issues like this to reform the system. and. Um, I, th I thought it was interesting that um, in, in what's before us, it specifies nonpartisan commissions, and I do agree with uh, my uh, colleague to my right that nonpartisan commissions are a hard thing to define. And in fact, uh, in my 15 years of living in Cook County, uh, Illinois, um, I, I know what nonpartisan commissions are, and they're not nonpartisan. <laughs> Uh, in most cases. Also, um, I think it's important to point out, as one of our speakers today, that uh, on Monday the U.S. Supreme Court accepted Gil v. Whitford, and uh, this is a case from Wisconsin that will be deciding uh, whether or not the Wisconsin uh, redistricting uh, was an overreach or created um, a partisan advantage that violates the constitutional rights of Democrat voters. Um, I think it's a good situation to have the court deciding this case and um, a favorable decision for Democrats will um, cut into GOP electoral majorities and uh, I think that's a, a good way of addressing certainly there are problems certainly we don't have the best situation or so solution um, but I, I do think that the US Supreme Court case is, is uh, the best way of addressing the problems um, and lastly um, with, with this issue that we're discussing, it almost makes you think that there's a problem. It almost makes you think that we have a system that's broken where a party in power, when it holds the governor, the assembly, and the senate in the state, can redistrict for their own partisan advantage, and that they would remain in power election after election after election. And that's just not what happens in our state. And I would um, turn our attention to the Blue Book um, in 2015-2016, um, this is the Wisconsin Blue Book, page 844. And I'll just read one paragraph because I needed to refresh my memory about the, the changes in uh, partisan power in the different offices in our, in our state over the past decades. The hallmark of contemporary Wisconsin politics is a highly competitive two-party issue-oriented system. At the beginning of the 1995 session, Republicans gained control of both houses for the first time since 1969. In 1993, 95, 97, the majority power in the Senate shifted during the session. Democrats controlled the Senate in 1999 and 2001, while Republicans retained control of the Assembly. They had won in the 1994 elections. For the first time since 1982, a Democrat was elected governor in November 2002. Republicans controlled both the Senate and the Assembly under a Democratic governor from 2003 to 2006. 
In 2006, Democrats won the majority in the Senate, and it goes on, back and forth, back and forth. We don't have a situation where redistricting, at least in our state, results in a situation where one party has a lock on power. And just because of the, the um, phrasing of nonpartisan commissions, I'll be voting. Thank you, Supervisor Buchanan. Thank you very much. Um, I will be strongly supporting this resolution. And as I'm listening to the discussion that's going around, um, I am very sympathetic to the argument that all people have their own biases and that just calling something nonpartisan doesn't make it so. We're a nonpartisan body in the common board. All of us have political leanings, which influences how we vote, not in a negative way, just how we view government. That being said, we had, for a long time in Wisconsin, the Government Accountability Board. You saw, you've seen Congress, the Congressional Budget Office. We do have examples of people who may have personal feelings about government that go one way or another, but are still able to come together on boards and commissions and have a nonpartisan view. We have examples of that throughout the state, throughout the country, and they've worked. So I actually have faith that people can have nonpartisan boards and nonpartisan districting. And one of the reasons why is because of objective criteria. When we looked at the last redistricting situation that took place, how do we know that the borders were picked the way they were? What was the public told? Nothing. They were done in complete secret. As a matter of fact, it took the Senate Democrats getting power back in redistricting to get any documents from the people who did that districting. So you had an entire redistricting done where how the uh, actual borders were designed was kept secret from we the people. And it was actually such a uniquely problematic process that if you go talk to our city clerk, and I'm sure that our county clerk can talk about this as well, they changed the ward systems that created such havoc in the way that we processed. We had to just completely revamp a whole lot of systems. And they did, um, anyway, the point is, that was done in secret. If we had an open board, that you could have objective criteria you can measure for, what would those objective criteria be? This, the distance or how tightly packed your boundaries are, natural borders, looking at partisan makeups, these would be objective standards that would be for the world to see and for the state to see versus being done in complete secret. Uh, last two things I would like to quickly mention are we've heard also arguments that this just isn't a problem in Wisconsin. Why are we talking about this theoretical concern if it isn't actually happening on the ground? And I'd like to point out that in 2012, the majority of the people of Wisconsin, it was a slim majority, but over 50% of the people of Wisconsin said I wanted a Democrat to represent me in the state assembly. Democrats got more votes than Republicans. Over 60% of the seats went to the Republican Party. The majority of the people voting for one party, and not just majority rule, 60% rule going to the other party. How do you have small d democracy when that exists? You don't. You have legislators picking their voters and not voters picking their legislators. I think that's wrong. The very last thing I will say is we've had this discussion before historically. And that was on before when we made the decision to have a one person, one vote system. You see, you used to have districts all across the country, state legislative districts, congressional districts, that weren't proportional. You could have one district that was five or ten times the size of the other until it took people stepping forward and it took court cases to say, no, you actually have to redistrict every ten years to have proportional representation. And we heard these same arguments before. Oh, this is just one side picking on another issue. Um, but it got to the very fundamental core of allowing people to make their own decisions on who will represent them. So I'll be enthusiastically voting yes on this because we've seen people be able to be nonpartisan on other boards throughout the country. We've seen factual, undisputed evidence that this is a problem in Wisconsin. And we've seen that there are ways that we can do it. And it creates a more open and transparent system when the people who are drawing the borders have to do so in the light of day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Gavin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would add that um, 
the, the nonpartisan agency that draws the line is just one uh, aspect that the resolution addresses, then both parties vote on what is presented. Another thing that didn't happen with the 2002 drawing of the lines. The nonpartisan commission agency does the research, draws the lines, but then they come back and both parties vote. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Wilkie. You know, I think we can use our county as an example as the way it should be when we drew our district boundaries. None of us were uh, allowed and should not be allowed to stick our nose into how those districts lines were being drawn. Uh, our, the staff did it. They developed a criteria as the previous supervisor spoke of and they drew those boundaries and however they would fall. It, it was interesting that uh, the last one that uh, the boundaries were drawn, the luck of the draw, I had an incumbent as my uh, opponent, but rightly so, I did not stick my nose in and say, oh, why don't you put him a little bit over here uh, so that I'm safe, that, that kind of thing. We kept our nose out of it. The way they're doing it now, they're not. And they're even doing it behind closed doors as was uh, brought up. So. I really would like to see us get back to having a democratic process uh, where non-elected uh, individuals uh, who are currently holding office are messing around with how those boundaries should be. I would encourage your support of this resolution as many other counties have recognized this same problem throughout our state. And Supervisor Condon. I just want everybody to note the irony of having a democratic process by which non-elected officials make the decisions. That just seems an oxymoron to me. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other request to speak. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this matter before we vote? It appears you are ready to vote. Let me repeat the motion. It's file 23. The motion is supporting creation of a nonpartisan procedure for the preparation of legislative and congressional redistricting plans. So if you please vote. Supervisor uh, Gatlin, yep. So. <laughs> one more confirm. confirm one more. Just confirm it there. Supervisor Gatlin, perfect. Thank you so much. That motion passes. 21 yes and 4 no. Uh, but members of the public, please not clap. We're not, I would appreciate it for the decorum of this body. I ask you to uh, not uh, uh, clap or boo or whatever. Uh, thank you very much. Moving on, file 10. Securing state funding to support communicable disease control for population health. May I have a motion, please? A motion by Supervisor Wilkie, second by Supervisor Willett, and an explanation. I'll start with Supervisor Bates, but then I'll go to Supervisor Wilkie, um, who introduced it. As a, but it got referred to administration, so Supervisor Bates, and then Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. to Supervisor um, I call this the also presentation with the found and cure resolution. If this is really to secure state funding to support communicable disease control for population health. If you looked at your packet, there was a number of there were a number of different sources of information that certainly are relevant to looking at this particular resolution. In the studies that were cited, we could see that there's been a significant rise, in fact almost a doubling in Eau Claire County of issues with communicable, communicable diseases over the last just short number of years. We've gone from 500 cases to 900 cases. And these are various kinds. Many of them, of course, are cases that could indeed not even have happened had inoculations occurred, information been given, information that led to interventions. So if we look and we say, what is the county health department currently doing? A communicable disease are one of the six focus areas for the department. And they have dedicated a significant amount of staff time 
to this particular issue, and they're working with coalitions of a number of different groups to try to make an effective approach to it. However, one of the biggest issues is the, the funding by the city and the county and some federal matches and small other grants simply aren't sufficient to be able to do the job that needs to be done. The state of Wisconsin does not contribute any funding to these programs in spite of the fact that the administrative rules designate, uh, designate required uh, communicable disease prevention and control. So this seems as though it's something that we need to move forward. We certainly need to think about what it costs us not to get this type of programming in place. And that certainly is a far, far greater cost than certainly being able to be sure that people have the information and access to the services that are described in our information sheet. So whether it's just playing measles vaccine, chickenpox vaccine, mumps, or it happens to be HIV, or even the new hepatitis vaccine, uh, obviously, if we can access services to people, we really not only have a safer, healthier community, but certainly at a much lower cost. Thank you. I would urge your support. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Bates. On behalf of the Administration Committee, this came from an individual supervisor. Supervisor Wilkie, of course, serves on the Board of Health, and Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, the only things that I would add is the, the City County Board of Health has already uh, passed a, a similar resolution and forwarded it to, to the state, as has, uh, as I understand it, a number of uh, other health departments and other co uh, counties. Uh, asking that the state designate uh, funding for communicable diseases. Um, I, I'm told that the good news is that currently, though a meager amount, uh, there's plans for to have that designated funding in, in, in the budget. Um, that, Though it's a meager amount, if that holds, uh, that's good news, then that, that's clearly the administration is, is recognizing the importance of this designated funding for one of these, uh, this being one of the core services for the city, county, board, or the health to, to provide. And in fact, as was stated, uh, state statutes uh, um, uh, mandate uh, that pr prevention and control of uh, the multitude of communicable diseases like e Ebola, measles, AIDS, tuberculosis, influenza, gonorrhea, rabies, hepatitis, polio, etc., and ma many uh, others. Um, uh, so we're hopeful that uh, uh, with already many resolutions being forward, this, this in fact will take place. In your packets, I would note that uh, our health officer uh, director of our city county uh, uh, health de uh, department provided you with uh, a multitude of uh, materials, as well as uh, sh uh, this being an important issue, she is here present, uh, would be happy to answer any questions that I can't answer, or if you'd like to hear directly from, from her. Thank you very much. Uh, open it up for discussion. Supervisor Stelges. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I do have a question, and, and maybe, uh, maybe it can be answered for me. I noticed particularly the, uh, the uptick in Lyme disease here. I'm having a little... little well, I'll take, oh yeah, yeah, I guess that's it. Yes, that's your answer. Thanks for that. Uh, so, uh, somehow I don't think of Lyme disease as being a communicable disease. Uh, having would, would had you use once. For some reason your mic is, is no. fickle here. It was on okay. and so on. If you just lean over to Supervisor Wilkie. Okay. Mike. So let, let's talk about Lyme disease. I don't think of Lyme disease as being a communicable disease, but Maybe it is. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I certainly have had it. My guess is I'm not the only one in this room who has. Can someone talk a little bit about why that's considered a communicable disease? I, I didn't think it spread from person to person. That would be our health director. Uh, is there any objection to Fleeska? 
Lisa, would you come to the mic so um, everyone can hear you and the viewers on community television uh, can hear it? Because all of you know this is broadcast uh, on community television, uh, both with the television as well as the website on demand. So uh, Lisa Gizzi is the director of the uh, City County Health Department. Thank you. Um, the quick answer is that we are required to follow up on all communicable disease. Some communicable disease is person-to-person -person transmitted. Some communicable disease is vector-borne, and vector-borne means it comes from something else, typically an insect. So Lyme disease, um, we do, uh, we're required to do follow-up on all Lyme disease cases. We have to call the individual and talk them through prevention and control um, and make sure that appropriate treatment is assured. Um, other communicable disease, we certainly are doing follow-up so that it's not further transmitted. So that is a different type of communicable disease follow-up, but certainly um, many of the communicable diseases, if we have a measles case, much of what we're doing not only is making sure that that individual case is appropriately followed up on, but that it's not spread. But it looks like the Lyme numbers are a big percentage of the yeah, if you look at the if you look at the individual disease reports, Lyme disease certainly is a large part of what we do, and we're working on a lot of prevention and control related to Lyme disease. But um, unfortunately, our sexually transmitted infections are also very high, and that is a obvious person-to-person -person transmission. So we have increased communicable diseases um, really across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, I see none. Uh, so let's vote. The uh, it's uh, file number ten. Uh, the motion is to secure for securing state funding to support communicable disease control for population health. You please vote. And that motion is adopted unanimously. Uh, file nineteen. Requesting resolutions to be considered at the 2017 WCA annual business meeting. I have a motion, please. Uh, motion by Supervisor Gatman with a second by Supervisor Miller and an explanation by Supervisor Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you look at this resolution, you'll see there are separate, seven separate resolutions passed by this county board that will go on if this is passed to the WCA board. This is the beginning of a process uh, that actually uh, determines uh, whether or not they will be supported or whether they're duplicative of what has already been considered by the board and is part of the platform of the WCA already. Eau Claire County has, uh, throughout the years, uh, certainly been an active participant in helping to determine the state support of certain resolutions. And as you read through, through these, I hope you will support their going on for that consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Supervisor Bates or any discussion on this uh, motion? I see none. Uh, so please vote on file 19. And the motion is requesting resolutions be considered at the 2017 Wisconsin Counties Association annual business meeting. And that motion is adopted unanimously. Moving on to file 30. Authorizing the increase of one meal site worker FTE from 3.75 FTE to point point, excuse me, 4.12 FTE. Uh, may I have a motion? A motion by Supervisor Miller, a second by Supervisor Leary, and an explanation by Supervisor Miller. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this request is coming forward, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. There was a pilot project that took place at the Senior Center a number of years ago, instituting an evening meal twice a month. And as a result of the popularity of it, there were volunteers and staff that were involved in helping it continue on. Now we would like to move away from having higher paid staff working there any further and having one of the current meal site workers just pick up like an hour and a half worth of time to cover that evening meal site. 
and that's really what it all only amounts to like an hour and a half a month. Uh, there will be no additional funds necessary or tied in with tax levy. This would all come in through the state and federal resources that the ADRC already has for the meals program. Thank you very much. Any questions for Supervisor Miller or any discussion on this matter? I see none. It appears you're ready to vote, so please vote. Uh, the motion, it's file 30, authorizing increase of a uh, uh, slight increase for the meal site workers' um, time. That motion is adopted unanimously. File 31. Replace one FTE volunteer coordinator position, grade G, with one outreach coordinator position, grade I. And once again, looking for a motion. Motion by uh, Supervisor Willett, second by Supervisor Cronk, and an explanation by Supervisor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if, for some of you who've been on the board for a while, you remember we used to have the Department on Aging, which primary focus was really the Meals on Wheels and congregate meal sites for the most part. And we always had a volunteer coordinator position tied in with that, primarily to help get volunteers to deliver those meals and, and uh, get to the homebound seniors. Well, in 2008, when the program went more to the Aging and Disability Resource Center and expanded all kinds of programming within that agency, the volunteer coordinator person suddenly was doing much more than just for the meals program. Uh, helping line up volunteers for strong bones program, which is building strength and balance for elderly. There's a stepping on program, it's a falls prevention uh, situation. There's a healthy eating program and so on. Plus, now she's doing the website, the Facebook, uh, and helps with the online event registration, and just has been doing general outreach efforts for the department. So that position as volunteer coordinator has definitely expanded over the last seven, eight, nine years. And it came to be that the, the title wasn't really totally appropriate any longer because of the outreach efforts and so the uh, program director brought this forth to the board and to human resources and said oh, we need to change the title and also which in turn would change the uh, step and the grade on the classification and when this came to the ADRC board we went she's getting a whole just there we go she was getting a whole dollar an hour raise and it was like oh my god after nine years however it puts her also in a position to be able to advance on the step chart as well uh, the ADRC board obviously unanimously supported this whole concept and uh, as did uh, human resources committee and I urge your support as well again Thank you for the explanation. Any questions for Supervisor Miller on this matter? Any discussion? Supervisor Olson. Thank you. We just, you know, went through all these reviews when we did uh, uh, the wage thing studies. How did this get missed? I'm not sure if it was one that was incorporated in the it was, <laughs> and we're trying to correct it. And, and Administrator Shaw uh, might be able to help answer the question too. Well, and I think that Oops, as Mike. part of this, you, oh, sorry, you're likely just, to just see. Just a second. Okay. Okay. Now you're on. okay. You're likely to see these happen um, at different intervals because making sure that our position descriptions are consistent with what the job actually is is an ongoing job. It's not a once and done. 
And so even though we did the classification analysis in a set year, we continued to constantly look at the relationship of employees' positions within the structure of the department. So it isn't unusual to have this type of a request come up at various times. Uh, Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, question. Um, changing the name from volunteer coordinator position to outreach coordinator position. Is this person still going to be uh, uh, also uh, recruiting uh, volunteers? Because obviously that's one of the most cost effective positions you can have. Uh, yes, so she'll still be doing some volunteer recruitment as well as all those other expanded job duties that she already has taken on. So it's it's a title change that's more reflective, however, of the broader picture of what she's doing, that outreach okay. type of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion? I see none, uh, so please vote on file uh, 31, uh, replacing the 1.0 FTE volunteer co coordinator position at grade G with a 1.0 outreach coordinator position, grade I. Supervisor Wilkie, if you'd uh, re vote there, please. Did it take for some reason? Thank you very much. That motion is adopted unanimously. File 32. Amending the Eau Claire County Employee Policy Manual, number 523, Safety Equipment. May I have a motion, please? Uh, motion by Supervisor Henning, second by Supervisor Gatlin, an explanation by Supervisor Miller, and I know. This deals with highway, uh, so if the supervisor anyone wants to do it, but Highway Commissioner John Johnson is here who can also answer questions or make some points. But Supervisor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you know, any policy changes in the uh, employee policy manual that has any type of fiscal impact one way or the other, those, those items are always brought forth to the full board. Uh, while having said that, the uh, department director has assured us that the fiscal impact has already been covered. It's just within their own budget, so it's not an additional tax levy or additional monies. But okay, be that as it may, uh, part of the change request is again the department director having reviewed some of this, realizing that it had no longer completely or equitably applied to some of the employees within the department because they're all now required to wear the steel-toed boots, for example, and therefore he wanted to be able to help them get the reimbursement for it, or it, it have this more reflective of what some of the activity is. Uh, also, it's my understanding that uh, staff have been, over the years, buying some of their own tools and then they, again, are getting reimbursed, but the amount has not kept pace with inflation or what have you. And if, and if I'm going off the chart here, John, please <laughs> catch me. Um, and perhaps the uh, highway committee can speak to this a little bit better than I uh, but anyway, the, the Committee on um, Human Resources the support this policy change and also, again, note that the, while some of the, while there is an increase in money, it is not an increase in the tax levy at this point. It's within the budget or in reimbursement from state <coughs> highway funds. And again, please feel free to ask John a little bit more if, if you have a lot of questions there. Thank, thank you for that explanation. Uh, and um, any questions or discussion on this motion? We'll just get right to the point. Maybe it'll be fine. <laughs> it doesn't appear that there are any questions or discussion. So it appears you're ready to vote. So let's do so. Um, the motion, it's file 32. And the motion is to amend the Oakland County Employee Policy Manual, 
uh, concerning safety equipment in the highway department. Supervisor Pagonis, if you do that one more time, thank you very much. The uh, motion is adopted unanimously. Um, um, uh, thank you, John, for being here. Uh, oh. oh, okay. Oh, that's right. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, file 17. Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. I have a motion, please. A motion by Supervisor Lavelle with a second by... Supervisor Olson, explanation by Supervisor Gibson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this rezoning petition is to rezone five acres from AR District to A2 Agriculture Residential District. Okay, would you use Supervisor Lavelle's? The county clerk will follow up with the uh, microphone company, but Supervisor Stone just has kicked out Supervisor Miller's and now yours, so I'm not sure what's up. But. All right, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a rezoning petition to rezone five acres from AR uh, district to A2 district so that uh, the owner can divide the existing home from the remainder of the applicant's property. This was, uh, hearing was held at for the town of Washington. Town of Washington uh, approved this unanimously. Um, this also conforms with the Eau Claire County uh, Comprehensive Plan and also the Town of Washington's Comprehensive Plan. And this came to the Planning Development Committee and we voted in favor of it 5 0 also. So I would recommend approval. Thank you very much for the explanation. I'll note Matt Michaels is here, Senior Planner with the uh, Planning Development uh, Department. Questions or discussion? Supervisor uh, Stelges. That working now? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, maybe uh, Supervisor Gibson or or Matt can answer this. It's uh, more just questions. The existing AR zoning. That this first question. Does that preclude the owner from selling that that part of the land, and that's why they have to go to A two? Uh, so that's the first question. And and the second question is that. In the discussion in there, it talked about that there was no when the rezone when a rezoning was done back in 2000 and whatever it was three or one or whatever some time ago, there was no restriction put on the remaining land, which I assume remains as A1. So with this action, is that not necessary or is it now being done? Uh, just clarification so I understand better. Supervisor Gibson, can you answer that, or um, would you like Matt to? Sure. That was a uh, error on somebody's part that it never got listed on the deed, and basically, uh, this is rezoning, the AR rezoning really doesn't apply, so in order to split this land off, it has to be rezoned in order to maintain the five acres. So if, if someone has a property that's zoned AR, part of their property is zoned AR, part of it is A1, they can't sell the AR portion? Is that, that's, so that's why they're doing this? Well, they can, they can sell that portion that was zoned AR because that, the rest of it has to be landlocked, deed restricted, or not landlocked, but deed restricted so that it can't be divided or sold off. The remainder? The remainder. The A1 part? Correct. So how, if this action takes place, how will that now stand? Can that A1 it, never got, it never got registered, so it's... It didn't occur. I don't know, Matt, if you want to add more... I'm pretty concerned. Is there an objection? I don't know why, why, why they have to rezone it if they just sell it as it is. Thank you, Chair Moore, members of the board. I'm Matt Michael, senior planner. Uh, just to kind of, uh, I guess, give a, going back to, to the original intent of this, normally an AR rezoning is for uh, a residence, 
farm related for the uh, family of the, the farmers. Now this is property that has never, at least in recent history, been actively farmed. There's uh, some timber on the eastern portion of the property, the remainder piece, if you will. Um, originally, if you go back 10 years in and if they had called my office, I would have said, you should be rezoning this to A2. And so when they rezoned to AR, they created a situation um, where really they can't or they shouldn't be just dividing that and selling it like they intend to. Basically, they want to sell the five acres that has the home on it today uh, and retain the remainder piece. Um, and the correct way to do that, as Chair, or excuse me, as Member Gibson stated, the best way to do that is to uh, remedy that through an A2 rezoning. Um, would this have been an active farming uh, property? I would, we would not have supported that uh, because the intention of these areas is to really uh, preserve active far and productive farmlands. That not being the case, um, using our normal evaluative criteria, we felt that an A2 rezoning would be, would be advisable in this case. So Sure. So is it that they can't sell it because it's AR today, or it's just kind of gray because it's not part of the intention of the zoning? I would say the latter. It's really, it's not clean as it is. Okay. And so the best and way is so to... So then what, what is the status of the remaining 50 acres? Is that still mm -hmm. A1? It would remain, uh, in this case, AP. Uh, I believe AP. I, I thought... Mm -hmm. So if they mm -hmm. came to... Now, want to reparcel mm -hmm. that later on, what would the situation be with that? Well, you know, initially they did, and we really advised them against it. Again, the intention being to really strictly limit the um, expansion of non-farm housing in these areas. So they could potentially develop an, a home on that AP lot, the additional 55 acres. Uh, but in terms of additional splits, uh, it's not something that, that we supported, and likely on the merits of that we would not not support that either. Even if there was, a, there would have to be a request made, and it would have to come back. To Go through the same process you're seeing yeah, here. Yeah. Would be reviewed at that time. Supervisor Begonis. I thank you. Isn't it correct though that an, an AR has to be minimally 35 acres? So to split off a five-acre parcel, it couldn't remain. Um, AR would have to be something else that could all, that could be as little as five acres. So I think, uh, Member Pagonis, you're referring to the AP district, which is a 35-acre minimum. I'm looking that, at Title 18. <laughs> I'm looking at Title 18, and it pretty specifically says floating agricultural residential mm -hmm. district, 35 acres. I could be wrong. Should be five acres okay. or less. I think what she means, Matt, is the... The remainder. The Go to AR floating is the parcel, the parcel that you wanted to make, which is is five acres. Thirty-five acres of that forty would be deed restricted, so that you couldn't. That's correct. Sell mm -hmm. And rezone. Okay, so you can take out the five, but the remaining thirty-five still has to remain AR. Correct. Got it. Thank you very much. Any other? Uh, Supervisor Steinhauer. I think there was one other problem that, that occurred. The, um, the, the, the deed was not made for mm -hmm. the five acres, so the five acres was never uh, developed. So the... the um, right. It had to be corrected. That, that needed to be corrected also. Several, several things mm -hmm. just kind of fell through the cracks right there. It just, the house was built without all the rest of this being put in place, without the AR, AR district being in place. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? I see, oh, sorry, Supervisor Duluka. Um, so I have a question. Um, you know, you look at the class of soils, and um, when this first came through in 2001, mm -hmm. that entire five-acre property is all class three. Mm -hmm. How did they even get permission to build a house on it when it says less than eighty percent should be no, um, you know, class mm -hmm. one, two, or three? 
Well, first, I can't answer what, what took place in 2001, unfortunately, and I'm not sure the institutional memory exists to, to do so. It's, certainly, it's not in the public record. Uh, as far as how that could transpire, it went through a public hearing process. Uh, I do have a copy, I believe, in your packet of the 2001 report, staff report, that does speak to that issue as being a concern that would need to be addressed. So at that time, it was, you know, it was discussed. And I, you know, do believe it's within the purview of the our oversight P and D committee as well as the county board to make decisions that are uh, keeping in mind that this is, um, you know, primarily driven by the comprehensive plan, which is uh, intended to be an advisory, you know, to give to give direction to these land use decisions. And so, the only thing I can vouch for is the way that we would apply it today, which would be uh, basically we'd make that evaluation make that recommendation based on that and then again through the public hearing process which uh, permits some discretion to decision makers they may they may say yes so in this case <clears throat> uh, because it's developed with a home etc it's it's an issue that you know we <laughs> Unless we could order them to remove the home or something right. no i understand it's kind of a moot point but um does this then, if you look at the other 54.4 acres, um, there is a lot of class three soil, mm -hmm. uh, potentially farming soil on there. Does that make it less likely that they will be able to split or parcel this? Because now once you've got mm -hmm. that home and the yeah. one acre five, you know, um, that five acre house, then the concern is that they'll continue to um, Break right. Down the rest of the property. Supervisor DeLuca, uh, yeah, I would I would say that that would definitely be an important consideration in any future proposals to divide the land. Uh, you know, we look at not only that soil type, but we look at historic productivity and just overall appropriateness for farming. Meaning, there are some areas that are very productive that are not within our you know prime farmland classifications, and there's also some properties that have good soils but poor conditions for. And as you know, you can see that over the last century they haven't been farmed for various reasons, usually topography. Uh, so what we look, we certainly look at that. And as I mentioned previously, the property owner did explore that. Uh, option, I think, of creating three splits, uh, to which we responded uh, unenthusiastically, and uh, we're seeing basically what we have here, which is that for a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, a bank loan, uh, typically people that want to buy the house, they're not going to be purchasing entire 60 acres. Neither would they have anything to, you know, to use that for, but in terms of lending, it would be, you know, challenging for a lot of people. So. Uh, the idea of parceling the five acres with a remainder piece, which uh, would have to be subject to, you know, further public process if they wish to divide it, would be, you know, was was the route that we recommended. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, any other questions for Matt or any of the discussion on this motion? I see none. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, once again, we're on file 17, and the motion is to amend the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington uh, as described. So if you please vote at this time. <coughs> and that motion is adopted unanimously. File 33. Granting an easement to Northern States Power Company at the Altoona Highway property. I have a motion, please. A motion by Supervisor Henning, second by Supervisor Will it an explanation by Supervisor Henning? I'm going to uh, divert that over to, uh, okay. to the Highway Commissioner. The highway commissioner. Okay. Um, so, John, if you come up to the mic here, please, that'd be great. <coughs> so, this is um, page 73 to 79 of the meeting packet. Good evening. Uh, this easement is. Um, if, a piggyback of one we approved earlier for Verizon to the communication tower. Basically what happened was Excel Energy, also known as Northern States Power, requested their own individual easement, which I told them would not happen. They can work in the existing one that we just approved, uh, but legally they had to have that under their own name in order to provide the gas to the generator for the communications tower. So uh, it's just a legal step that we have to take and provide that easement for them to operate in that same piece of land. So that's all this is. 
Thanks for that explanation. Yep. Why don't you stay there just in case anybody's got questions. Any questions for uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, our Highway Commissioner? Um, or any discussion on this motion? Supervisor Conlon. We do kind of want that gas, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yep. So that way your phone will work and the backup generator will turn on and your phone will work. Yep. Okay. Right. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Uh, John, thank you very much. Yep. It appears everyone has uh, present any other discussion. So please vote on file 33. The motion is granting an easement to Northern States Power Company at the Altoona Highway property. Up to you. Oops. Um, do you want to vote on the, the highway shop? Uh, the, okay, that, that motion passes unanimously. Um, moving on to file, I guess, yeah, file 25. Awarding bids for the spring 2017 tax deed sale, tax delinquent property, directing Corporation Council to perfect excuse me, prepare quick claim deeds and directing the county clerk to execute said quick claim deeds. May I have a motion, please? A uh, motion by Supervisor Conlon, second by Supervisor uh, uh, Schroffnagel, and an explanation by Supervisor Dunn. Uh, as the documents at the back uh, indicate that there were three parcels that were, uh, that were bid. Uh, the minimum bids were exceeded in all cases. And uh, uh, we have uh, actually made money on a couple of them, so um, it was kind of a, that's a good deal. Uh, one of them was a very narrow site, the other ones were there, but we've, we've made uh, $23,603 on the net, say, the net profit and loss on that. So I had to re re request your approval of, this, of these transactions. Thank you for the explanation. Any questions for Supervisor Dunning or any discussion? I see none. So uh, let's vote on file uh, 25, awarding uh, the bids, various bids for the tax deed uh, sale of tax deed property. That motion is adopted unanimously. And our last uh, item of business this evening, file 27. Authorizing payment of vouchers over 10,000 issued during the month of May 2017. Final pages 93 to 94. May I have a motion, please? Motion by someone. <laughs> okay, Forsyth, second by Mortimer. Uh, thank you. Any uh, questions on this? Supervisor Lavelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, 33 uh, U.S. Postal Service, that's always 20. Is that a contract at 20,000? That's always 20,000. Or they always have a Okay. Okay. Uh, County Clerk Loomis, I think, can answer that. Or, yep. When they put postage in the postage machine, that's the amount they put, you know, loaded oh, okay. up with. All right, all right. My next question is uh, also about the rear damage sheriff's vehicle. Do we, are we self insured or, or what is that deductible or why is it? Which, which line, line are you at? Line 40. So line 40 on page 93, uh, dealing with the Altoona Auto Body LLC rear damage repairs on a sheriff vehicle. Is that a deductible or is that true? We would have a deductible portion, but I will find out specifically on that item and get back to you. $12,169.91. I will get you the information on that. Just curious, okay? I mean, it's Okay. Please say okay. Good for you. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? I see none, so please vote on uh, file 27, authorizing payments of vouchers over $10,000 issued during the month of May. And Supervisor Bates and Henning and Anton. Supervisor Anton, if you re-vote, it didn't take uh, heading or er, Bates. Uh, there we go. Thank you all very much. That uh, motion passes unanimously.
We're at the end of our agenda. Thank you, everyone. Great. Have a good month. We'll see you July 18th at our next meeting, if not sooner. Thank you, everyone. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and Eau Claire County. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.